We talk with our children about it. Abortion, abortion, abortion. We've been programmed through time. We could talk about abortion, but it's assassination. It's murder. And we don't go talk to our kids. I want to show you something on TV of beheading or dismemberment of, of a body. But this is exactly what it's doing just because it's small, insignificant to most people. It hasn't breathed the breath of life yet, but it's still life. And by the way, who gives life? God. And God has the right to give life, and only God has the right to take life. But we in our society have gone so far to heathenism that we think it's okay just to snuff out a life. I'm not doing that. <laughs> promise you I'm not doing that. But life is so important. I appreciate the pastor saying the church is taking me on to be your missionary, and I hope I'm worthy to be your missionary, and I hope I never bring shame upon the church or our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is a missionary, by the way? A secondary citizen? Someone else could go to be a missionary that can't do anything else. And what is a missionary? Does anyone have an idea what a missionary is and what he does? I is one. I have been one. Now 40 years. And to give up some things, I had a decent job. I made a decent wage. What made the difference was when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and here comes my voice. Thank you, my brother. You put Duracell in, or? <laughs> what it was? Energizer. And Duracell is uh, made in Japan now. Well, like everything else. Where was I? In there. Being a missionary, been there for about 40 years, and had a decent job, made decent wages, couldn't have couldn't done better, but I got, I got saved, except for the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, and I got saved. Now, a lot of people say they get saved, and it means nothing to them. I got saved, and it meant something to me, and the Spirit of God spoke to my heart about doing something. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to sit on the pew and be fine like everyone else, but he said, no, I want you up and out of here, and so up and out we went. Went to school, uh, went to Chattanooga, Tennessee, went to Jackson, Michigan, went to Missouri, went to Florida, went everywhere you can think of going to school, and I still only got past second grade. The more I learned, the less I knew, the dumber I got. But one thing I was told when I was saved was this book. This book right here is more important than anything else. There'll come times in your life when the pastor won't be with you. He won't, you won't be able to call him. You won't be able to call it crown his shoulder. But you have to go back to the book. Now I know you people read the word of God all the time. I, mean, I can look in your eyeballs what I can see. And I can't see past the front pew. But I know you read the word of God all the time. You've got, a, you got a, a system you read. You read in the morning. You read at noon. You read at night. You read sometimes. You read the word of God. And you have a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Now. On the mission field I have no one to call. I still have someone to talk to, talk to my wife, and believe me, she can talk. <clears throat> but you get into the Word of God. It's amazing what you, when you talk to the Lord, when you're talking about the people give prayer requests, and you think, of, talk about, think about big things. And when you're on the mission field, sometimes you think about the little things. Just little insignificant things. And you'll have a conversation with, as the pastor said, come and pull the throne of grace. It's a great, great place to go. But we can commune with God anytime we want to. What does a missionary do? He goes to the field in hopes to be able to preach the gospel, in hopes that some will respond to the word of God, the gospel, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it starts from there. And then it's the growing time, as it is in our lives. We're growing. No matter what age you are, it's growing, growing, growing. And the pastor preach, preaches, and he's looking at the people, and we need to grow. We never mature. We never mature. We're always growing, growing. And we reach to the point where we think we're mature, we backslid. We're growing. We're children in the Lord. It's babies. And everyone was hitting around what I was going to say to talk about this morning. I said, man, they're stealing my thunder. And Larry's back there. He's about to steal my thunder. And the preacher got up here and almost stole my thunder. And I realized I didn't have any thunder anyway. <laughs> but anyway. If we start off, if you would, we're looking in Judges chapter 2. And we're not going to cover the whole Old Testament. And if the preacher allows me, I'll say this. Does anyone even have a question about anything, about where I am or what I'm doing, about Mexico? No? Okay, being your ask, since you ask, I'll tell you. <laughs> Mexico is one of the most dangerous places on the face of the earth. 
We have killings every day. Average homicides per day is 97 to 100 every day. Those are the ones that are recorded. It's open war warfare in Mexico. And the cartel runs through the streets with pickup trucks with M50s on the back of their truck. They rule the roost. It's not the federal police. It's not the army. It's the cartels. And we're talking about a country that's got a president that's a liberal, is a socialist communist. We're going to the way of Venezuela and they're a southern neighbor. How would you like to have our neighbor next door to you that bad? What would you say? You would say, there goes my neighborhood. Amen? There goes my neighborhood. We've got to move out of here. We've got to find somewhere else to live. I can't put up with this. With dead bodies here and heads here and all the shooting and all, all the things that are going on. We've got to move. We've got to get out of here. Folks, there's nowhere else to go. We're it. That's right. And our nation is crumbling. And mo most of the people in the United States are asleep. I was just reading on the news, and I'm sure everyone reads the news that I knew before they got on the news, everyone coming to the States with children, 100% comes into the United States, 100% stays in the United States. They ship out 57,000, 60,000 every month into the United States. That's not fast enough. They put them on planes in McAllen, Texas, and fly them to other places in the United States of America. They provide everything that you can think of. And who does the pay? The American people. They have snookered us over the years. They've allowed us to kill babies and assassinate babies. They've allowed us to go wicked, our nation. Yes. The only thing that's holding this nation together is the believer. Right. And I use the word believer because Christianity is overused, I believe. Yes. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people claim to be Christians. What does that mean? When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you committed yourself to a person. Mm -hmm. He gave it all. And how much does one life cost? Every drop of blood. Talking about the veterans that gave every drop of blood for our freedom. Our, our freedom was paid for, it was earned, and we have it today. But we're losing it because people think we, it's a gift. And they're not concerned about freedom, don't what freedom is. And they want to do away with the older population because the older population is the history of the United States of America. Now, I see some slick heads, and I see some gray heads, and I see some almost gray heads. Uh, brethren, when we're gone, it's it. I believe we went through the greatest generation in the Second World War. Now, I believe we're going through the last generation. Unless the, unless the United States of America turns, turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and worships Him one more time. Otherwise, I believe we're gone. And I know, I know you don't have another question, and I t told Roger, I said, I'll be quick. He said, if you're too quick, so Brother Ken will get up there and finish it off. <laughs> so, so we're going to try to stretch it out a little bit so Brother Ken won't have to get up here and stretch it out a little bit. But there's one thing that plagues our nation that was hit all around this morning that we all have a problem with is forgetting. It's not necessarily because we have gray hair, no hair, or age. We have a tendency to forget. Sometimes we forget our names, we forget where we are, we forget what we've done. I've done this before. I went in restaurants and I sat down at the table and talked to a person never saw in my life. And I said, how you doing? Remember me? We did such and such. Now, you look, you've look. you tried that sometime. You just look on their face and they're running them up through their minds. And I, yeah, wait a minute. When was it? When was it? They think that they do. We have met, but their memory has failed them. We are to the point in the United States of America, we just don't care anymore. Forgetting. If you look at Judges chapter 2, we see the downfall of Israel. There's three basic things, I believe, that caused the downfall of Israel. In Judges chapter 2, and I've got all 23 verses, so we can be here a while. In Judges chapter 2, and we'll just go verses 1 through 23, but there's only 23 in here. We won't go that far. We'll just go 1 through 10. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and, and said, I make you to go out of Egypt, and I brought you into the land which I swear... Unto your fathers. And I said. Don't you like it when someone tells you the truth? Yeah. You know Jesus went away. And he coming back again. He tells us the truth. Yeah. I like that when someone tells me the truth. Yeah. I like someone to tell me the truth when they're lost. Yeah. And we're in Mexico. I don't like for someone to lie to me. So I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. But I live like the devil himself. Uh, we need to be truthful. And we as believers. If we're truly believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to tell the truth also. Right. How do we tell the truth? By just saying we're telling the truth. As we know, the fruit that falls to the ground that produces identifies the tree. 
So we say that we're Christians. What fruit do we bear? Now in Mexico, when a person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ, and mostly young people, the older people are hard to, to reach because they're grounded in the Catholic doctrine. But when people accept the Lord Jesus Christ, they have a, the struggle of growing. They've got to grow out of Catholicism and grow into the doctrine of the Word of God, and it's a battle raging. And I was talking to Roger and Wanda, you'd be amazed that people are raised in the United States of America today from childhood up. As if they not, not know, but they gain so much knowledge by just sitting in Sunday school class, by just sitting in church. They gain so much Bible knowledge that when the preacher stands to preach, and I told Roger, and I do this myself, when the preacher stands to preach, he starts preaching, and my mind starts thinking of other scriptures as he preaches. This is normal. Does any of that happen to you guys? Yes. We start running, we run a reference. But in Mexico, they don't do that because they have no reference. Mm -hmm. The message has to be a little lower and simpler. And you have to deal with it one phase at a time. And growth goes a little slower and a little slower. But it does happen. People do get saved and people do grow. And where was that? Verse 2. And you shall make no league, and, and you shall make no league among the inhabitants of this land. But oh, we messed up there. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? That sort of hits us between the eyes too, doesn't it? Our nation was founded upon godly people, godly principles, and the Word of God. And we've missed the mark somewhere. We have made league with the things of the world. Even though we don't think so. Go with me to Mexico for 10 years. And come back to these United States of America. And walk into our Baptist churches today. And then you'll see a difference. But daily, you don't see the difference. But just walk away and come back. You'll see the change, not only in our, in our nation, but you'll see the changes in our Baptist church. And I call myself a Baptist. Because if you don't call yourself a Baptist, Baptist you must be ashamed. But I'm a Baptist. Verse 3. Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before, thee, from you, before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides. Their gods shall be a snare unto you. And the things we have in our lives that correlate with us today when we get saved, there's things in our lives we don't fully get rid of. There are certain things we hold on to. And they become snares in our lives. And they hinder us and they hold us back. But we've become accustomed to it. We got this thing called cell phone. We got this thing called television. And we get accustomed to what we see on television, here on television. We love these programs on television. And we don't see anything wrong with it because we have been accustomed to what is in the world. It becomes a part of us. But as a pastor mentioned this morning, are we on fire for the Lord? What is our main desire for life? Is it to see people saved? Is it to see people to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the reason I went to Mexico. Not because I was going to make more money. Not because I was going to be more popular. Not because of anything else. God put within my heart and my soul to go to a place where they needed the gospel. And it's a difficult place. We've seen things and experienced things that our children don't have to experience things they should have never experienced. But it's for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and you go to these places and people get saved. And then you think, Lord, I know I'm going to heaven because it's appointed unto every man wants to die. No one in here can escape. It's appointed unto man wants to die. But once I get to heaven, Lord, I said, it would sure make me feel good. If someone would come up and tap me on the shoulder... And said, because of you. And because you came. I'm here. It would be worth it. If you lived your entire life. In the United States of America. In North Carolina. And we got to heaven. And someone come and tapped you on the shoulder. And said, I watched you. And I listened to you. And because of you. I'm here. Now let's reverse that. We that are born again, washing the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be behind the white throne judgment. And we will be seeing those who are not saved. Now what we will hear, I do not know. But we can see their eyes and their expressions. And what if they looked at us and said, because of you, I'm here. Because of you, I'm here. 
That would be a sad day. And I believe a lot of us are going to hear it, including myself. And thank God He's going to wipe away all the memories and all the tears. But at that point in time, our life's going to be before us of what we could have done. But things we forget. Israel forgot what God had promised them. We know about what happened to Moses, what God promised Moses. They went, they went to the promised land and go into the promised land. God promised and proved that he could take care of them. Fire, in the, fire by night, food in the daytime, everything was provided. Listen, you can trust me. Now all I want you to do is send out 12 spies, come back, and I want you to go in the country and possess it. You already know I'll take care of you. You already know I'll fight, fight your battle. You proved that against, against the Pharaoh. You'll know I'll do those things. Yes. Now let's go do it. But they chose not to do it. They forgot what God had done for them. Many times we forget what God has done for us. And we forget that God is still with us until for us, until wants us to go and serve the Lord Jesus Christ and do what He wants us to do. What is the downfall of our nation today? I believe one of our downfall of our nation today is simply because the same thing the downfall of Israel was. He instructed the people of Israel to do what? He said, I want you to do this. There's no books, no television, no cell phones. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do it the hard way. I want you to sit down and talk about it in the morning. I want you to talk about it in the middle of the day. I want you to talk about it in the evening. I want you to talk about me. Yeah. I want you to talk about what I've done, what I can do, Almighty God. I want you to rehearse this before your children every single solitary day. And when you're walking, when you're working, you talk about me. Yeah. Yeah. What do we do today? We talk about football, basketball, everything under the sun. But do we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ? In a conversation that's freely with us every day. Mm. Now, when Roger and I sat down to talk, believe it or not, we talk about the things of the Word of God. We talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. We talk about the preacher. Oh man! <laughs> oh. But it's the good things we talk about the preacher about. The good things. Well, we talk about the things of God, which a believer, it's just normal. But our nation is not normal. Our nation does not talk about the things of God. They hate God. And that's why they want to, uh, to assassinate babies all the time and take uh, God out of schools, pray out of schools, pray out of lives, because the nation of Israel had forgotten, but it didn't forget overnight. It didn't forget overnight. I'm burning up, preacher. And I'm, I'm not going to hell either, but I'm burning up. But we didn't become the nation we had overnight. It took time. And it's going to take time, if God gives us time, to get it back on track again. But it's going to be done by the believers. But Israel forgot God. He didn't even follow the instructions of God. And didn't train their children because what are, what are our children? Our children are our what? It's our future. The future of the church are the young people. Not these gray heads and bald heads out here. They're not the future of the church. They are the church right now, but they're not the future of the church. It's the young people that's going to be the future of the church. <coughs> I've been in churches since I've been out of Mexico, and I kid you not, that all I've seen is gray heads. That's all I've seen. Now, is it appointed unto every man wants to die, and they're getting closer, just like me. But there's no one there to take over, to go forward. Our churches are dying slowly because something's going wrong, not only in our nation, but within our churches. We don't talk about the Lord. We're not excited about the Lord. We don't we talk about in the morning, noon, at night. And we don't talk about those things and, and about people being saved. I won't ask for a show of hands, but when's the last person you ever witnessed to? When's the last person you had the opportunity and the privilege to lead to the Lord Jesus Christ? And it's a privilege because some soul, some water, but who gives the increase? God gives the increase. Right. Now, I've been to Mexico and I've reaped other people's uh, uh, work. They have witnessed. And I've been privileged to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing with me. But... Our nation took a long time to get in the condition of sin. It's going to take a long time to get out of this condition. I don't think we have time. I don't think we have time. I think the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back quicker than what we realize and quicker than what we want. But he's coming back to receive us unto himself. Now, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff and go down here. And go down, if you would, just go to a simple, simple uh, verse in Ephesians chapter 2 and 8 and 9. And you know it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you know it. For by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. And that not of yourself pertains to what? Not the grace. Pertains to the faith. And therefore we have nothing we can contribute to salvation other than accepting what He has done. And from that point forward, to be His witness to others. 
And when I was saved on January 3rd, 1971, I was so excited. I went and told my dad I was born again. And he said, son, did you speak a one word in an unknown tongue? I said, no, I did not. He said, they sold you a bill of goods. You're not saved. And I was just freshly born. And I was, I was just depleted. My, my balloon had popped. So I went, went to my pastor. That's where you're supposed to go, right? I went to my pastor. I said, Pastor, what have you done to me? I said, I thought I was saved. He took the word of God and said, did you do this? I said, yes, I did. Did you accept the Lord Jesus Christ? I said, yes, I did. He said, let me tell you something. There's one thing you can depend on and you can't depend on anything else in your life is the word of God. That's right. You can't depend on your feelings because there will come a time in your life, your young Christian life, that you will doubt if you did everything exactly the way it was supposed to be done. Did I get on my knees? Did I say the right words? Did I was in the right mood? You're going to question, am I really saved? But you go back to the word of God. And that's what we have to base on the Word of God. And that little talk with my pastor for 39 plus years has helped me through many scrapes. I've had to go back to the Word of God. I had no pastor to call. I said, come preacher, come visit me. Back to the Word of God. And when you get into the Word of God and realize all you have is the Word of God, it will become more precious to you. Salvation by faith. Even God that gives, gives, gives unto us. And a young man used us in the Sunday school class, I think. And this young man was mean as a rattlesnake. I mean, he was full of it. And I thought he would never get saved. But he made a profession of faith. And the preacher knows young people make professions of faith. And you say, I hope it sticks. I hope it lasts. I hope it produces some fruit. Well, this young man left. He didn't know where he went. He come by the house beeping his horn. It's a peeper. And all of you know what a peeper is. It's not something you peek through the window. It's a peeper. It's a propane truck. He goes by and blows his horn trying to sell gas. And he said, Armando, Armando. I looked around him, couldn't recognize him. And then I recognized his voice. He was, ah, you know, no, it's Fernando. Como se llama otra vez? Fernando. Fernando. He said, Armando, remember me? And when he said, Fernando, I said, you little rascal. Yeah, I remember you. Yeah, I remember you well. He said, I was saved. Amen. When you were here. And later on, I left. He said, Amanda, I got married. And I got two children. And we're in church. And we're faithful. Now that makes it worth it. Yes, it does. And that's what it's about. Seeing people saved and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. We've had people moved away, come back and look us up. He said, Brother, I just want to let you know that we're still walking with the Lord. And where would they have been if we hadn't went? And where would they be without us today? We're so needful in a world that has forgotten God, forgotten the Word of God, forgotten the sanctity of marriage. Everything is forgotten. And brother, when we don't, we start forgetting. The whole world changes with us. And J. Edgar Hoover said, so goes the home, so goes the church. And so goes the nation. And we're living in perilous times today. As Israel lived in perilous times, they turned it back on the, on the God the Father. And, God, and then they, they just went downhill from there. Now, what they did, they changed some habits and things in their lives. They changed the way they thought. They changed the way they approached. They didn't think about God. And they didn't care about God. And they changed their, their goals in life. If we don't have goals in life to please the Lord Jesus Christ and see souls saved, we're just, we're just walking and doing nothing for the Lord. Now, Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 14. Let's see if I can find that. See, I marked my Bible because I couldn't find it rapidly. I'm not using my Spanish Bible. And what we do, I do in Mexico, which you don't do here. When I go to a scripture in Mexico, I have someone in church read it. And also in a church in Mexico, we always read the Bible before service. We have someone come up, we'll read a chapter, two chapters every service. And those people that don't read the Word of God at home gets to read the reading of the Word of God in their ears while they're here in the church. So we do that. In Deuteronomy 7, 14, uh, 7, 1 through 14. And when the Lord God shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gigasites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Pegasites, 
and I'm not pronouncing those right, but they're there. And the heavy sites and the heavy sites. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them all and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. And I'll stop there. And what is in our lives today is the same thing they did. They made a covenant with the evil nations. We in the United States of America has more or less made a covenant with our nation and our programming on television and everything else we watch. We sort of made a covenant. We just let it slide. It used to be from the pulpit, the pastor would preach about honky-tonks, about borrowing being too close to the church, about adultery, about fornication, about sin. But we don't hear that much anymore about preaching against sin. We sort of moved in close where we don't really feel too much. We feel more at ease with the world and the world feels at ease with us. And we need to get away from that and we need to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and put Him first in our lives. But when we do that, we change some, some goals in our lives. We have no longer want to please the Lord Jesus Christ. To please Him. And sometimes to please the Lord Jesus Christ, it may mean a little sacrifice. Now, I would just ask for a raise of hands this morning. Said, yes, I want to be used of God. And many would raise their hands, I want to be used of God. But you want to be used of God. And I want to be used of God the way I want God to use me. But it may not be the way God wants to use me. It may be like the widow woman. God had to prepare the widow woman for Elijah. He prepared her for many, many years. And then she says, Elijah said, bake me a cake. And she says, no, I'm going to bake a cake for me and my son and we're going to die. Have you ever seen anyone starve to death? Now try to place in your mind now. She said, I'm going to prepare a cake for me and my son. And we're going to die. She didn't say we're going to blow our brains out. She didn't say we're going to cut our throat. She says we're going. I'll take my last meal. And I'm going to die. She had to be a pretty slim woman. Had to be slim pickings. And she's talking about going in. Preparing the last meal. And to starve to death. But God prepared her all those years. And what she went through I do not know. To be used in Elijah's life. Now I wish they want to be used of God. How many times? Just once? It may be just once. But where? Where would it be? What circumstances? So when we raise our hands and say, God, use me. Be careful because we want to be used the way we want to be used by God. But God wants to use us the way He wants to use us by God. What if you were thrown in prison? Me and Cuba are thrown in prison. In Venezuela. Other places have been thrown in prison. What if you were thrown in prison? Oh, could all this happen to me? But it might be that one prison cell. Maybe the one that God wanted you to speak to. And you could have never got that individual any other way. Mm -hmm. Are you willing? Yeah. Are you willing to take that step? Yeah. I took the step. I was on my way to Venezuela. No one could have changed my mind. I was going to Venezuela. Had my passport. Had my visa. Had my barrels back. What little I had. Thought I had a lot. Didn't have anything. And we was going to Venezuela. And God closed the door. I got sort of upset with God. I said, that's not right. I said I would go, and I'm prepared to go, and now you close the door. So he sent me to Rio Grande Bible Love Institute in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Texas, to take language school. So we had to do a cultural trip into Mexico. And I took a cultural trip into Mexico. And I did not like Mexico. Didn't like the smell of Mexico. Didn't like the look of Mexico. Didn't like the Mexicans. Didn't like anything about it. But that's where God touched my heart. He said, this is where... I want you to be. But until I was moving, he couldn't have put me over there. And the same thing in our lives today. If we're sitting on the rock, wanting to be used of God, and wondering why we're not being used of God, maybe we need to get up on our feet and start moving. And the God that will direct us where he wants to use us. And God's not winning any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now God wants many people saved. Amen? Yes. Yes. How badly do we want to see people saved? I believe in the local church. I really do. And I believe it's the local church's responsibility to get the message out. Amen? Yes. yes. And what consists of the local church? Believers. Well, brother, and I believe he's called. Everyone needs to be called to preach the gospel around the world. Many are called. Few are chosen. So I believe that we have missed the mark somewhere. Now, all this stuff's happening on the border. I know it sounds bad. But think along my lines along this way. Saying, if you won't go and reach these people, I'll bring them to you. Yeah. I'll bring them to you by the thousands. Now what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Are you still going to let them die and go to hell? 
And all you've got to do is learn a little bit of Spanish. It's not that difficult. You can learn enough Spanish to witness. It's not that difficult. He sent him to us by the thousands and thousands and thousands. Well, I said, well, they hadn't sent him to my neighborhood. How many of you need a visa, a passport to move about in the United States? How many checkpoints you got to go through? We go through them all the time. How many times you got to be held at gunpoint? We've been held at gunpoint many times. We've been robbed within Mexico. But we're in the United States of America. And so he's bringing them here by the multitude, thousands. And we don't even have to leave the shores of the United States of America. Do we really want to see people saved? You know, it's not hard to learn a few words in Spanish to invite them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So God wants people saved. He wants to work through the local church. But we as a local church have gotten sidetracked. Now, they lost some things in their lives. One thing they lost was their conviction. I hate to see a believer with no convictions. Oh, yes. I'd rather see a drunk man. I'd rather see someone on dope and say they're not a believer and they're doing what they're doing because they enjoy what they're doing and they're lost. But it has to see a believer with no convictions. Now, the Pope says it's time that the Catholics need to change their convictions. I'm saying as a Baptist, it's time for us to shore up our convictions. Stand up for our convictions. There's things that I will not do. Things I will not say. Places I will not go. Don't compromise. We need strong convictions. But they lost their convictions. They blended with the world. And the world didn't know them. And they didn't know the world. It was always one, one smoldering pot. <clears throat> and one thing, and I'll close. That our churches have lost. And sometimes I think I lose it. It's a pioneer spirit. A will to go on. A will to go on. But sometimes it's difficult. There's times I want to throw in a towel. And I'm going to tell you why I stayed in Mexico and why we've been there and why we're going back. I can see in my mind as you can see things in your life. I can see in my mind what I'm going back to. I can see the people that we deal with. I see where they live. Some of them come to church stinking pretty bad. But they're still souls. Yes. I can see where it is. But... When we forget our purpose for being here, it's not to have things. It's not to have air conditioning. I, I really like it. In fact, this coming summer means our utility bill has went sky high and we can't afford to have air conditioning anymore. We go back to the old way of sleeping outside, sleeping in a hammock, sleeping on the porch, fighting the rats, the spiders, the tarantulas, and make it through the night. It's what we did when we first went. Why? Because people were lost. It's not the circumstances and the conditions we go through. If you lose the vision, the vision of people lost can die and go to hell. That's what it's all about. Yes. But brethren, come and go with me. And we get it much accomplished. If you don't want to go, God sent them here to you. Now, while we're in Mexico, I'll tell you the value of prayer. And I'm going to close. I've been in Mexico. We had a prayer warrior for us many years ago. Her name was Sister Aquila Anderson, Sister Anderson. She was a prayer warrior. She'd ask for our, our requests and she would pray. And we could feel the presence of God. She prayed. She was a prayer warrior. She went home to be with the Lord. And I being a missionary in Mexico and a pastor being a pastor behind his pulpit, there's one thing I'll say about the pastor now. You should pray for him, Dr. When it's in the pulpit, she's praying for every single day. Every single day. That the power of God will rest upon him. He have liberty to preach and teach the word of God. But in Mexico, I can almost tell you when no one's praying. I can feel the presence of evil. And I don't believe in psychics and I don't believe in this other stuff. But the church, the local church, is our strength. Yes, it is. Not just the pastor mentioned this morning to say a little prayer and say amen. But to pray. And that's where the power comes from. The people in the local church, the believers in the local church, the local church. And that's how missions goes out and that's how missions get accomplished. Now brethren, more than I need your dollars and dollars and pennies. And I can use them. But I need more than that. I need your prayer. Not just mention, I mean pray. I don't have a whole lot of years left. The pastor don't have a whole lot of years left. None of us have a whole lot of years left. But I want to see more souls, souls saved. Yes. Yes. I want to see souls saved. I want to see people grow. I want to see others lead others to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got the second, third generation coming in the church. They're reproducing. Yes. And it happens. But... You've got to have convictions in your life. 
I'll close on this. We were going down the road and everybody wants me to drink like the Pope, smoke like the Pope, go to the bar rooms like the Pope. They call them depositos. But I won't go. So I was going down the road and they want me to drink. And I said, no, I'm going to drink and offer me a beer and all this. And for one day I said, okay, I'll stop and take a beer. So I stopped and took a beer. I popped the top on it. I said, this is mine. Yes, yours. And I said, chug a lug, chug a lug. And they said, what are you doing? I said, didn't I tell you I didn't drink? And every time I pass by those guys, they don't necessarily go to the, go to the deposit so They go to shoot trees or whatever. They'll take their beer and do this. <laughs> he may stop again. When they know that you live what you say you are. I proved to them I didn't smoke. They said the same way. You prove to them who you are. In Mexico, how many of you know what a quinceanera is? Somebody knows. A quinceanera. What is a quinceanera? 15 years old, and they take you to the church, yeah, and you become a full-fledged woman. Yeah, she knows. That's the Catholic tradition, but I didn't have one in church, and our young girls wanted to have one, and the mothers, of course, they didn't come to church. They wanted to have one. I said, we don't do that. We're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. A young lady 15 years old it's not a full-fledged woman. And they teach that Mary gave birth at what age? Fifteen. Fifteen. And they say, well, you become a full-fledged woman at fifteen years old. And they turn their young people loose. And it's tough. It's tough. There's nothing in the home. In our homes, if we don't teach our children, talk about the Word of God, talk about the things of God, and freely talk about it, not beat them over the head with it, but it's part of our nature, part of our life. They see it in us all the time. They'll take note. Just like they see when we're lying. When we're lying. And when we're arguing. And when we're fussing between husband and wife. Don't you think they don't take note? They take note. And they also take note when you talk and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless our, your people. Lord, help them to live for you in the most important things in our lives. And the reason we're here is you want to see people saved. You didn't go to the cross in vain. You didn't shed your blood in vain. Our purpose for living is to please you, share the gospel with others, that many will come to know you as a personal Savior, that many will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, Lord, help us to be a part of that. Help each one of us to be able to say, when someone will tap us on our shoulders, and say, thank you, because of you, I am here. Father, have your will and win our hearts and our lives. We love you. Lord, help us to love you the way we should. In Jesus' name. Pastor.